Hey everybody, I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse. You're watching Disruptive Investing. And today we have with us David Liu. He is the co-founder and CEO of Clarity Movement. Thank you so much for being with us today. Yeah, great to be here. So we just got this really cool sensor from you guys and we got to check it out. It's actually on a tree outside the studios right here. Uh, we've been testing it for a couple of weeks. And um, why don't you tell us what it does? Yeah, tell us what, what it's doing out there. <laughs> yeah, so um, essentially for Clarity, we provide uh, Assessing a service that uh, complies hardware, software, and, and expert support that we provide to organizations such as governments and schools or lots of industrial complex or people like you <laughs> to help you understand the air quality around you and to really help you to understand. Uh, and to measure it, understand it, and take action. Now, when I was in college, uh, I remember passing by in Kenmore Square in Boston every day on my way to school at BU, um, this big like trailer-sized building that had things sticking out of it. And it was just for air quality. And uh, they had to devote like an entire like half a city block to doing all this stuff. And like I think that was the only data point in the city or something at the time. Um, but now we have the sensor outside our house, which is this. what we're showing it to you right now on the screen. It's tiny. Um, it's solar powered. It's got a battery in it. So you can set it up anywhere. It's set up within minutes for us. Mm -hmm. um, and tell us what this thing can do and why it's so amazing. You can consider that a miniaturized, uh, miniaturized version of this expensive, bulky air quality monitor you just described. So we can basically uh, monitoring uh, criteria air pollutants such as PM25, NO2, at the fraction of the cost as government does um, in a form factor that is uh, self-sustainable in terms of operations. We don't need to rely on any external infrastructure, but um, kind of only operate on the solars and the building solar connectivity, and then can be operated within 10 minutes. Uh, probably you guys also have that experience yourself um, to yeah put up to a place in the city and it's not to measure your quality around you. So, David, can you give me like a real world example of how you would use these sensors uh, to monitor something like you were just mentioning, like cities and stuff can do it? Like, how, how would this actually be put into use? Yeah, I think a really good example would be our unified school district, which is the second largest school district uh, in the United States. Uh, I believe they have, uh, I believe, like 1,500 of campuses uh, all across the LA counties. So in the past, um, they had to rely on the government monitoring stations uh, uh, that has only, I would say, a couple of points in their districts to decide uh, what they can do when the air quality is bad. But the fundamental problem is that it is um, air quality varies, and especially in a huge places and a complex geographic location like in LA County, that information is not sufficient enough for them to really take very effective actions to help to protect the health of the students and the teachers. So um, we have been, you know, doing uh, providing them this network that composed 200 of our clarity uh, sensors uh, all across the valley and uh, to provide this much more detailed information of their air quality in a real in a real time basis. And in some cases, uh, we really see how effective this can be. Uh, An example like here on the screen kind of shows that uh, in certain cases, the location that has the worst air pollutions is 10 times uh, of the locations that has the cleanest air pollution. So, I mean, if I'm LA Unified School District, before I just had, you know, a couple data points and I'd have to either say like, everyone go home today. <laughs> you know, or but now I could say like, oh, it's only schools within this radius or you know, maybe this specific school that has to maybe, you know, stay home today. Right. And let's take a step back and just talk about um, what air quality means in terms of uh, human health, because I think that a lot of people understand like what smog is. And especially when we're talking about L.A. or, or um, China, we think of smog sometimes. Um, but air quality isn't I mean. It's obviously horrific once it becomes smog, but even before then, air quality can be unhealthy for people. Um, and what are some of the you know short term and long long term effects of that? Yeah, so I think what health organization estimated that outdoor ambient air pollution probably costs around four point two million per metric deaths every year. Wow. Um, and uh, if you combine with the indoor air pollution, that figure is closer to seven to eight million per year. And I just want to have that figure sink, like sinking, right? That's more than probably the total deaths of recorded COVID deaths that we have experienced from the pandemic start. And that's every year, right? 
Yes. <laughs> but this is every year. Wow. And I want to talk about the invisibility of it. Um, you know, I think a lot of people think that air quality is only bad when you see it, when it's mm -hmm. smoke um, that you can see with your eyes. And it's like that is not the case. And it's so hard for us as humans because we um, are born and live in air. We don't think of it like water in a fish tank or something like that, where we, you know, if you think about water in a fish tank, you think like the fish is in the water. OK, we are in the air just like the fish is in the fish tank with the water. Well, and I want to go to the sensor we just set up. We set it up outside my house and I thought this was really going to be boring because I thought, you know, I live in a really clean air environment. So I will just see a yeah. flat line of cleanness. We're in Massachusetts. Right. We're in a suburb. I was expecting us to have really, really good air quality just consistently all the way across every day of the week. But um, yeah, why don't you call up our Clarity um, dashboard that we've got here? Yeah. And show our unit. Um, and this is in the last few days. And it's really easy to read this, actually. We're seeing the AQI, which is so what does AQI mean again? Air quality index. Air quality okay. index. OK. Yeah. And so just, you know, uh, orange is bad. Red is bad. Green is good. And then, you, yeah, you see this peak right here on uh, the 8th. And Jesse and I, like, we're like, what happened on that day? We can't even think of what it would be. Like, it could be someone nearby was having like some kind of fireplace event or it could have been a diesel truck but like i wouldn't have known that there was going to be a bad you know air quality point but this captured it for right us. all the way up to unhealthy and that's outdoor air quality um something that i just didn't expect to see i grew up in this house i i thought we have great clean air all the time worst case a truck rolls by but you can see that it went up for hours yeah. during during that morning um and then it, it took all the way until noon to kind of drop off into um you know healthy ish air levels so david i've been on a board of health here in my town for over 20 years and when it's come time for us to have to look into like um asphalt plants and stuff we have to hire outside consultants they usually cost tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars it takes months to set them up and then we have to have long meetings with the public about where to set up uh, monitoring stations. And, it, you know, it's usually we have to limit it because it costs so much. And so we only get four instead of six. Um, tell us how that's different now with your technology. Yeah. So I think what's our mission of the company is really to try to make it accessible for people to be able to measure and understand and therefore take actions around the air quality issue, right? And I think this accessibility really down to the form factor of the hardware devices. Um, how do you operate it? How can you get accurate data out of it? And how can you visualize this data? And how can you analyze this data? And I think that's what Clarity is essentially offering and why we think it's a sensing as a service, because uh, we believe that you know, in order to truly offer this tool that will empower either governments or community like yours to take action around the air pollution, uh, we need to make it much more accessible. So I want to get down to the brass tacks of this. Um, how much is it going to cost either a municipality or one of the groups that you've, you know, you're mentioning to install or to have um, some number of these sensors? Do you have kind of a a, a general guideline? Is it is it per sensor? And then you've also talked about sensing as a service. And what does that mean in terms of pricing? Yeah, so sensing as a service meant that we uh, have a very predictable uh, budget for you. It's based on how many measuring points you will be measuring and what pollutants you will be measuring. Um, so um, in terms of the pricing, uh, I think it's going to be varies uh, based on what your network size is, what the pollutant exactly you need. But one thing I can say is, you know, like the one unit price is probably a hundredth of what a traditional air quality monitoring is. So wow. imagine what you can do uh, with uh, these solutions. You can get dozens of this point or hundreds of this point at a, a pretty reasonable price. And then to knowing that exactly what you're getting, uh, you know, uh, our hardwares in which will be provided and it will have in this warranty all, you know, all through the lifetime of the subscription. If it's broken, we'll replace it. Um, and then you have access to the dashboard and you will have that expert support throughout the whole duration. That sounds amazing. Um, but I also want to talk about why did you choose, um, like solar powered and such a small unit, you know, why, why not just have something that you could uh, plug in? Yeah, I think it's really down to 
um, our idea of accessibility, right? I think when you have a device that needs to be plugged into an outlet or relying on existing communication infrastructure like Wi-Fi or something, then that's restrained on where you can place the sensor at. Let's say, you know, for your community, you want to measure in this asphalt, and maybe the best place to place that is this telephone pole that, you know, you have no infra, like no other access to the power outlet whatsoever. It is really to helping our customer to understand the air pollution is, what the air quality is at wherever they want and wherever they want. And I think that's kind of the, you know, the principle behind our design. I mean, because otherwise you'd be limited, like you're saying, in some place that has uh, power. But I mean, mo like you walk down the street, there's not just outlets. Right. Like they, the power company put up telephone lines and, and power lines, but they didn't put, you know, a little 110 outlet that you can plug a sensor into <laughs> at yeah. every telephone pole. It, it's still like you'd need a box. You'd need a meter. Well, and, need... and this is one reason why I wanted Clarity to send us a unit, because when we installed it, we just pretended that we were the dopes that we are. <laughs> and it is not attached to my Wi-Fi network. Mm -hmm. It is not attached to any power. And so it not only provides its own power, but it has a SIM card and the magic of SIM cards. So that it, it is basically talking to your network without me having to do any setup yeah. whatsoever. And that to me is incredible. I want to go back to LA for a second. So now they have hundreds of points, clarity points. Um, it just sounds like it would be so expensive because it, normally you'd think, well, technicians have to go out, but you're saying basically just send the units out. Anybody with half a brain can put it on a pole um, and then it just starts working. And so can you just give me an idea, like if we had to do that the traditional way with hundreds of points back in say the 2000s, um, what would it have cost versus what it cost them today? Usually a monitoring station like that traditional way would cost around, roughly around $50,000. So then you waste 200 monitoring point and you're talking about a $10 million CapEx cost. That's not including the installation cost and operational cost, right? So imagine you have to hire all the technicians to do that, like, because for bigger equipment, you bet you need that. Um, so you're probably looking at half of that, like, you know, the budget probably would just go into the installation. So that probably another three to five million dollars just for installing all this equipment. And now, uh, uh, then on top of that, the maintenance costs. And you will be shocked by how expensive it is. <laughs> it's usually, I would say, you know, around 10 to $20,000 per year. So you're looking at additionally another two to three million per year to simply operating the whole network. Um, so, and we are able to do that. Probably that's like one tenth to one twentieth of that cost. But if you're looking at the lifetime, it's so much, so much cheaper. I just want a disclaimer here. I am an angel investor in this company. Um, and I had forgotten that I was an angel investor in this company till we started talking to them. I'm in Jason Calacanis's, uh one of his launch funds. And so I, I saw the other day, I'm like, Clarity, wait a minute. I was talking to Clarity. I'm an investor. <laughs> um, so full disclaimer, uh, my enthusiasm is not only because the product seems so great, but because I'm also invested in it. Um, and to David's point, my mind just started racing with so many use cases here. You could be on the private side. You could be that asphalt plant, right? And you want to know what's going on so that the government doesn't get mad at you. Mm -hmm. And so you could put up a few of these very inexpensively and find that out. Which, by the way, could save you a lot of money from in time and effort with your you know local government if you catch things before they become a problem, which I would strongly recommend right. to companies <laughs> out there. Or you could be that local government that's trying to clamp down exactly on a, on a polluting uh, or a source of of horrible pollution in your community. And like what you were saying with fence post monitoring, um, normally you wouldn't be able to set up that many stations to monitor the air pollution. And so if the wind is blowing in a certain direction, you might miss a whole day where they were pumping out well above what they're supposed to. Um, whereas if you have enough of these as a fence post monitor, along with wind tracking, then you're going to be able to know exactly where the pollution came from. And here's another point when you're dealing with, with the public, the public wants to know what's going on. And when I've had problems in the past with, uh, you know, things in our town by the time you get the data out to the public it's months old the data you know you give them a report at a meeting and then everyone has to kind of scroll through it and they kind of think that you're hiding something from them these plans have been on display at the planning office now for a year whereas with this technology because there's a dashboard if the town wants to make that public mm. then they could just say like hey anytime you want to go and check the data up to minute data go for it and that makes the public feel like they are a real stakeholder and they are like oh well we can see what's going on which changes the whole feel of everything from like having to reveal stuff for months later to getting them to be part of it day by day. Because it really is all about 
having data. Yeah. It, it's one thing to say, I smelled something the right. other day or it, it's felt really bad out. That is so easily poo-pooed, set aside and ignored um, by interested parties that might not want right. anyone else to care about it. And, and David brought up another good point, which is if say there's wildfires in your area, right? Mm. Being able to get up to the minute data for your um, residents to let them know that like, oh, it's it's bad right now, rather than tell them hours and, or days later um, when that information doesn't matter anymore. Right. And David, I want to ask you another question. As Clarity starts to um, increase in size and the, and the number of sensors hopefully starts to um, get bigger and bigger, are the sensors just going to be used for the individual stakeholders application. So say we had fence post monitoring around an asphalt plant, but it's some Sunday that they're not even running and uh, there is a wildfire event going on. I Would mean, other um, groups be able to use this data to kind of help build a model for I don't know, something, air quality moving through a much larger area? Yes. So um, as a matter of fact, um, I would say, also our default position regarding the data ownership is that you own the data, uh, well, we have the full ownership, but we do actively partner with different organizations and also governments to uh, encourage our users to publicly share in their data and the benefit that will be benefiting the public. So, um, so I think on our own side, we actually have a website called openmap.clarity.io, it's called openmap, in which um, our customer can opt to public sharing their data uh, on that website. And then in addition to that, we also, uh, as mentioned earlier, are working with different organizations, popular apps, air quality apps out there to provide them the public um, uh, air quality data for free <laughs> as a public goods to really sharing with the public as well. So, you know, some very, you may already using some of the data right now, we're using a popular app, such as like the, I, like maybe the IQ Air or, um, or, uh, or the, you know, uh, uh, for more professional users, the uh, tomorrow IO and, and so on. So like, I can't really say much, but we are also working with the like kind of a, a, a government as well to, to, to be able to integrate our data. And then where do you see Clarity going forward in the next like five or 10 years? Where would you, you know, what new products would you like to get into or how many more of these sensing units do you think you'll be able to get out there? Yeah, I think for us, it's really rooted in our mission. Um, so uh, it's about to help the customers to measure, understand and take actions around the air quality. So I think on one side, we will be constantly expanding the number of pollutants that will be uh, uh, measuring for the customers. So we now have PM25 and NO2 in the node as, as a default options. But in addition, we have add-on modules that can seamlessly plug into the side of the nodes that can provide additional measurements, such as wind direction and speed that will enable you to understand where the air pollution is coming from. Um, we can add ozone uh, monitoring, which is uh, a, a big problem in rural regions of the United States. And then the third black carbon, which is kind of a you know, very common in diesel combustion particles, uh, and then also the wildfire uh, burning as well. Um, so um, that's something that we are currently offering, but then down the road, we will be expanding into uh, more uh, pollutants that will be, I would say, associated with climate a bit more, such as uh, methane, CO2, total VOC, and so on. Yeah. One of yeah. the things I love about being an angel investor is meeting really intelligent, driven people like David, who are, you know, making this company. Um, it's a lot of work. As I've watched each of these companies that I invest in, it's not just like they had an idea and they do it. It's years and years of ideas and pivoting and changing and growing teams. What's it been like for you to go from you know, I'm, I'm assuming maybe like a kind of garage stage, right? Or, you know, um, to moving into a company stage, what's it like to have to put on new hats? I think for me as like a uh, wanted co-founder and CEO of the company, I definitely feel like my role has changed quite a lot through the different stages of the company. Uh, I feel in the beginning, um, I am much more involved in product development. So I feel like I'm engineers, I'm a product manager, I'm a project manager, I'm a designer, like I do everything, right? Um, um, and Later on, uh, it definitely, I feel like um, I'm starting to become a salesman. <laughs> I'm trying to let the customer to adopt our solution. Uh, I'm trying to sell our company to investor and you know letting them to invest in our companies. Um, and to now, I feel like it's kind of I, I feel like Clarity is finally in a stage 
that we have, I would say, decent amount of resources to really grow more sustainably. If viewers are watching who are, you know, in NGOs or municipalities and they want to reach out to you and learn more, maybe about funding, maybe about getting your sensors, uh, where should they go? Go to our website, uh, clarity.io. Uh, That's great. Thank you so much, David, for being with us today. Okay, thank you so much for <laughs> having me.